what I'm going to show you today is going to be a part, uh, it's a, sub a sub-segment of my book. Uh, as you all know, I wrote a, a book called An Inflammation Nation, and if you haven't read it, please do. Um, but what I also want to do today is kind of take one little bit of part of it and then go into a little bit more detail. Um, for those who you haven't heard about the book or you haven't read it, you can go back to last year's lecture, the year before I covered actually the 10 steps, the definitive steps, what I call to preventing, reversing, and treating all diseases with diet diet, lifestyle, natural inflammatories. But today I want to talk about microbiome because it is a subsection of my book and wanted to kind of give just more of a, a general summary. What, what is the microbiome, how to tune it up, how to repair it, and how to restore it. And um, although the details in my book today, I'm going to cover a broad stroke of just understanding what the microbiome is. So let's get started. So what is the microbiome? Well, the microbiome is what I consider the first line of defense of your body. You know, it begins with, um, it's the first part of digestion, absorption, uh, exc excretion, and it starts from the mouth. A lot of people kind of tend to forget the mouth, but it starts with the mouth, goes to the stomach, small intestines, and colon. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a lot of pictures because pictures are worth a thousand words. And understanding your own physiology, I mean, unfortunately, most most people don't have, uh, you know, anatomy classes or, or, or human body classes or even home ec uh, in school anymore. And so we kind of tend to just go to the doctor and we have a problem, we see a commercial and we take a pill or we even take a supplement, but not understanding just your own normal and anatomy can be um, uh, a disadvantage because once you understand how things are working, then you can kind of work through why are the recommendations or what we should be doing to help restore and be participating in your health recovery and help optimization. So it's, it's where 80% of your immune system resides. So a lot of people think, well, where's my immune system? Well, most of it's in your gut. And we'll talk about that today. And more importantly, over the last five years, where a lot of research is coming and exploding in the microbiome sphere is looking at neurotransmitters and how the gut brain axis and how your gut controls your mood. And I'll explain that as well. So let's get started here. Now, we all have heard of this term probiotics. Right. Everybody talks about probiotics. You see commercials on television all the time. But I want to just get into a little bit more specifics about probiotics because there's just a misunderstanding. A lot of people think, you know, for example, when you go to the store, you see a commercial. OK, there's a product that says like, oh, my GI doctor tells me to take something called a line. It's a probiotic species. Well, it's fine. But guess what? It's only one billion of one species. And we have over a thousand species. In fact, it might be much, much more than that by the time I finish this lecture, because every day they're discovering more and more new species uh, of probiotics. Now, the interesting thing is the total probiotic population is over 100 trillion CFUs. Now, when you get a probiotic, you'll see like the little units on the back of the package, or it tells you how many you know billions or millions you're getting. Those are what they call CFUs. That's the units. But we have 100 trillion in our gut. And the interesting thing is when you go buy a supplement, you know, like I was mentioned the one before, just the GI doctors might recommend or something you get over the counter, it has one species of only a hunt of one billion. And we're talking about a hundred trillion. Okay, so it's just worlds away. So is it does it mean that probiotics are bad? No. But what it tells us is that there's a lot of discrepancy in what the market is delivering. We need to get potency, we got to get purity, we got it safety and efficacy. That's kind of our mantra at San Jevony. And what we've been looking at is that now we have to start looking at dosing at higher doses, particularly when people actually have true dysfunctions. So we're starting about 100 billion or more. And now when you look at the clinical research with pharmaceutical probiotics we're giving out, they're talking about almost giving, you know, 800, 900 billion in a serving many, many, many more times than the average person will get anything over the counter. And more importantly, just to kind of put that in, in, in a summary of how much probiotic is in our gut. It's about four pounds on average, three to four pounds, the total weight. So when we talk about our gut, and I'll tell you how long your gut is. And if you were to sprinkle these little things all inside your GI tract, it's a lot of probiotics. So a lot of people think it's kind of like homeopathically, just small little bits there. Four pounds. If you got a four pound bag of rice and you had to carry that around with you, you'll see that that's quite a lot of weight. So probiotics are most uh, is, is quite important. And understanding that 90 percent, let me let me show you here, you know, probiotics, most probiotics are guaranteed at the time of potency is at the time of manufacture, not at the time that you take them. So what does that mean? If someone says they're selling you 1 billion of one species, that's the time of they make it. 
Now, when they make it, they're also like it goes to the factory, then from the factory it goes to production, and then from the production it goes to warehousing, and the warehousing goes to distribution and shipping, and then finally gets to your store. And then you know it sits on the shelf for a while. You buy it and you take it home. And that could be anywhere from three months to nine months uh, in that process time. And we now have data to show that that potency, you know, at the time they said one billion or maybe ten billion or maybe twenty-five billion, and it starts to decrease over time. In fact, it, it, the, there's what they call a degradation of probiotics due to the temperature, due to the humidity. And so when we actually look at um, creating probiotics, and I've, I've been kind of a very OCD about this for many, many years now, is that we're looking at things like acid stability, you know, making sure that the probiotics gets past the stomach acid. Again, most products in the market are not there for that. So they might even give you a right species or species. They might give you even a right dosing, but then it's not acid stable and it gets destroyed in the stomach acid. And then again, most of them are a few billion or less. So you really want to look at a higher potency as of multiple species. And right now, if you went to the health store or if you went on uh, online and you bought all the probiotics that you have on the market from any brand, any company, from a large a manufacturer to a doctor's brand, for example, there's only about maybe 60, uh, 70 maximum different potencies. I mean, sorry, different uh, probiotic species out there. And remember, I talked about there's over a thousand species. So we're really behind because it's hard to, you know, manufacture, it's hard to actually test because we also want to make sure that these are the right type of bugs, the healthy bugs, not bad ones. And then also it takes a long time because of the purity of how they actually have to extract these things to make sure that they're living and are safe enough to give because there can be, you know, bad uh, probiotics as well. Right? There's, there can be pathogens as well. And also there's a lot of delay in the, the science because of who discovered it, how they scientifically have to name it. And, and there's people all over the world, scientists from very risk, a variety of countries that were now looking at, well, who discovered what first? Because now the goal is now in terms of pharmaceuticals and, and nutraceuticals is patenting and kind of trademarking these things and, and uh, um, having those aspects of like, it is our strain because they've discovered it. But what we have to understand also is that they're not only acid, not acid stable and low potency in most probiotics, but also when people try to get it in food like yogurts or kefir or kombucha, it's just really not enough. Now, are these things helpful? Sure, absolutely. From a food-based standpoint, you should be having. Now, we're going to talk about not having it from the dairy. You can have plant-based forms, right? But don't just consider like I'm eating a yogurt or my doctor says I need to take a, you know, some kind of a probiotic um, yogurt to help fix my gut. In fact, when you actually look at some of those studies on the ones that you see on television, you have to take like four to six of those and there's about $4 to $5 per per, per yogurt. So again, the, the cost is not really there to actually have a true clinical benefit. We're going to talk about things that you can do with your diet. In addition to taking the right kind of probiotics, we always give that to our patients. And so our patients will always say, gosh, Dr. Pai, I tried your probiotics. They're so different. It's like, yeah, because we've been looking at potency, purity, safety, efficacy with all our products. In fact, our probiotics are guaranteed at that potency at the time that you take it. So we actually put in more. So we look at temperature and degradation over two years and ensure that at the time that someone takes a probiotic from us, that it will have exactly what it says on the bottle, in the bottle at the time they take it. Now, probiotics have a, a wonderful role and the role is actually helping with digestive system and immune system. Uh, as well as many other things, but these are just simplifying just some major categories. And we all know that when we take antibiotics, you know, it does kill bad bacteria, right? Because we need to take out an infection. So you have a sore throat, you have a pneumonia, you have a urinary tract infection. Great. We give antibiotics and thankfully we have that, you know, outside of sanitation, antibiotics is the thing that's kept our, our population of humans uh, alive on this planet more than anything else. But the problem is it also kills the good bacteria. It's non it's non uh, specific. So it kills good and it kills bad. Just like in war, there's never a, what they call a smart bomb. We're trying to get more targeted aspects, but there's always going to be some kind of collateral damage. Now, what most people don't know, and this is what I want to get across today, and that's why I kind of went into this idea of talking about um, microbiome, is that natural antibiotics do the same. You know, this is a common misunderstanding that almost most of my patients who come see me from all over the world uh, when we do Zoom consultations is that they will be taking natural antibiotics chronically. So they'll say, you know, uh, Dr. Pai, I had a history of yeast infections and I uh, was told to take oregano oil. Or I did research or I'm taking a product and it helped really well. Um, and they go, how long have you been taking? And they'll say, well, I've been taking it for like six months. And they go, how are you feeling? Well, I feel like I'm, I'm getting worse. 
And the reason being is because natural antibiotics, meaning coming from plants, also do the same thing. They kill bad bacteria correctly, but they also kill good bacteria. They're not discriminating between just because it's natural that it's only getting the bad guys. And that's a quite a, a common misunderstanding. So people buy things at the health food store or from uh, natural healthcare practitioners and sometimes continuously take something. Well, I'm taking this candida cleanser, this parasite cleanser, some kind of you know anti antibiotic, or or more importantly, we've seen in the last couple of years, you know, with with the the essential oil revolution uh, that we see this misunderstanding of uses of medicines kind of now given to the public where people willy nilly will just take, you know, I take oregano every day for prevention, but that's like taking amoxicillin every day for prevention. You wouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. These things should be given in certain potencies for a certain period of time. Otherwise, you're causing more harm than good. Now, we do know interesting thing with, with the last couple of years is that one dose of antibiotics you know, just one pill of a simple amoxicillin, which we do need to use, by the way, in certain types of infections uh, or any kind of antibiotic can cause GI dysfunction up to 18 months later. So it's not always at the time, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm, I have, I, I take an antibiotic, I get diarrhea, or I'll have to take probiotics to prevent me from getting diarrhea. But that, that GI dysfunction may not happen in that seven or 10 days that someone's taken antibiotic. In fact, it actually can happen almost up to two years later. So most people will then never remember that, oh yeah, I had an ear infection or a respiratory infection, say in the winter time, and now it's coming here spring and forgetting that, oh my God, that could be causing some of my symptoms or my higher risk of having these kinds of symptoms, as well as we also see is chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is actually even more damaging to the microbiome. Now, we need to give chemotherapy in many instances we, uh, for cancer. Um, the question is, why do people have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, mouth ulcers in the use of chemotherapy? Say, for example, someone has breast cancer, someone has a brain tumor, someone has skin cancer or colon cancer. You know, a lot of people say, well, gosh, I understand if I have colon cancer and I'm taking chemo to kill something in my gut that I should have symptoms, maybe some nausea or vomiting or something like that. But um, we're looking at, well, what about, um, what about um, those kind of uh, aspects? Hold on a second. Uh, those kind of aspects of looking at when someone gets chemotherapy, why, is they ha why are they having um, side effects when it's not in the area of where the chemo is? So for example, someone has a brain tumor, why are they having nausea and vomiting? Why are they have, you know, someone's had breast cancer, why are they having nausea and vomiting and diarrhea? It's because the chemotherapies kill cancer cells and cancer cells are rapidly dividing cells, right? Because they're just growing out of control. Um, but what happens is the, the first fastest turnover cell in your body is actually your GI tract. The, the, from the cells in your mouth, all the way down the esophagus, all the way down to your stomach, small intestine, colon, rectal area, those cells every three days are shedding. Okay. So it's the fastest turnover cell, you know, like your red blood cells last three months, your skin, you know, is always constantly, you know, uh, exfoliating, your hair is always growing, your bones is a one year structure, for example, it takes a one year to have a complete new skeleton of the, you know, each bone cells, you know, adding a bone cell and removing an old bone cell, but your, your, your GI tract from mouth to bottom is a three day cycle. So what happens is chemotherapy correctly kills a cancer cell but indiscriminately, unfortunately, then it also gets confused and says, hey, you know what? This cell is also rapidly dividing and it hits the GI tract, okay? So that's, I just wanna explain that because a lot of patients get confused. They're like, gosh, you know, my tumor's over here. I understand it if I was having problems over here that I should have GI issues, but why am I getting GI issues regardless of what type of chemotherapy I'm choosing or any kind of chemotherapy? Because, you know, there's newer ones and immunotherapies and old ones and low dose ones and high dose ones and cocktails. But that concept is that it's hitting these cells indiscriminately. And that's what we have to start looking at. Now, what we need is that we do need to use antibiotics in certain cases. We do need to use chemotherapies in many cases. And we need to use natural antimicrobials when we have the option, but there is a collateral damage done. And so we need to understand how do we restore that function? And once you understand how to restore that function, this needs to be addressed by the way, then you can actually bring back that person back to optimum health. <music>